There is a problem with the explanation that has been provided by the Rebbe in the Sicha as to the core difficulty that is addressed by Rashi, namely the superfluous li in the phrase of Avayikhuli Truma, and for which the Rebbe maintained that the li is lishmi and is connected to the vayikhu, that the contribution of the truma must be lishmi, l'shem shamayim, and therefore by extension, a contribution lacking in the lishmi would technically be invalid. This conclusion would appear to be in conflict with a statement recorded in Mishnah Shkalim Perik Aleph, dealing with the collection of the machatzit shekel the half shekel, an obligation that is recorded in Chumash Shmot 3013, Parshat Kitisa, where the Machasit HaShekel is referred to in this Pasuk as a Truma LaHashem. The translation of Shmot 3013, with some shuffling with the sequence, reads as follows, that Kol HaOver Al HaPekudim, everyone who goes through the counting system, which is code for which members of society were to be included or excluded from the census, Ze Yit Nu Machsit HaShekel, they were to give a single coin identified as the half shekel, and this half shekel was the shekel hakodesh, according to the shekel measurement system, which was used for kodesh items, which may have been different from the shekel used in the day-to-day business dealings. The text goes on to define the value of the shekel used for kodesh purposes, that it had the value of esrim geira. A gera being the smaller denomination, the shekel had the value of 20 gera. The pastor concludes with a statement to the effect that the machzit shekel truma la Hashem, the contribution to God was to be a half shekel, not more, not less. In the language of today, we would refer to this machzit shekel contribution as a broader based tax upon the community that was used as a tool for counting the size of the nation, somewhat akin to the census that many nations conduct every five or so years. As such, there needed to be a system for the collection of these half shekels. The Mishta in Shkalim informs us that this was accomplished through the Shulchan Not, very much akin to the money exchanges that are found in airports throughout the world. These Shulchan Not functioned as exchange bankers that provided three basic services. One, foreign exchange for people coming into Yerushalayim, bringing with them money from a different country or a different system to be converted into the coinage of Yerushalayim. A second function would be the changing of large denominations into smaller coins, specifically when they functioned as a collection agency for the Machzit HaShekel. And the third would be, as we have today, the place for the safekeeping of their wealth. Mishnah Gimel opens with a statement regarding the time frame that Bahamisha Asar Bo Shulchanot Hayu Yoshvim Bamedina, these government employees, the Shulchanot, would open shop in various locations throughout the countryside from the 15th day of Adar onwards, during which time they would receive and record the payments of the half shekel. The Esrim Chamisha from the 25th day of Adar onwards, Yashvu Bamikdash. The Shulchanot set up a shop in Yerushalayim, in the Mikdash area, because by that time there would have been the beginnings of the influx of people coming to Yerushalayim for the sacrifice of the Korban Pesach. As this was a form of a census and tax collection, there would have had to have been ongoing records of the names and addresses of the population. In the case of elections, we have the electoral rolls, and in those countries that have compulsory voting and a fine leveled against those who refuse to vote, there needs to be fairly accurate lists of those entitled to vote, similarly with the tax system. This is not a new phenomenon, as we see from the Mishnah, that clearly there are people who did not wish to pay the Machzit shekel tax. And the Mishnah addresses this issue by stating, Mishnah Yashvu Ba Mikdash. Once the Shulchanot had relocated to the Mikdash area, then Hitchilu Lamashkein. The word Mashkein linked to the concept of the Mishkan. It has a Shin Chaf Nun Shoresh to settle down, to live. It also has a parallel translation of to take or to give a pledge. In some cases, a guarantee that that money that needed to be paid would be paid. The suggestion here was that people who had not paid their Machsit shekel 
The authorities had the power to enter the property of the individual and take possession of something of a value which would be returned upon payment of the Machsit shekel. In today's day and age, this job is allocated to the sheriff, who are empowered to take action against people who do not comply with their debt-related court orders, and if need be, confiscate and actually sell property, etc., to pay the debt. Understandably, these sheriff's officers would not be beloved members of the community. The Mishnah goes on to identify which segments of the population were required to give the Machsit HaShekel and for whom property could be confiscated by the authorities should they refuse to pay this tax. At me, Memashkanin, which segments of the population did the authorities have the right to confiscate property? Or put differently, which members of society had the obligation to pay the Machsit HaShekel, keeping in mind the secondary function as a census tool? And in that list are Levim, Yisraelim, Gerim, people who had converted into Judaism and Avadim Meshuch Rarim, non-Jewish slaves who had been given their freedom. Of Lord Nashim, the Machsit HaShekel was not elected from women, Avadim, full-time slaves, Ukutanim, nor from minors who had not yet reached legal adulthood. The Mishnah ends with a very interesting statement that Ve'en Memashkinin et Kohanim. Technically, the Kohanim were required to also participate in the giving of the Machsit HaShekel if, however, they refused, their property could not be confiscated mipnei darkei shalom in order to maintain a semblance of peace between the population and the Kohanim. However, this is to be understood as explained in the Gemara. Herein lies the con between the Rebbe's understanding of Rashi's commentary of Li Lishmi, that a contribution lacking the Lishmi component is invalid, which means it had to be given willingly, not through force, and assuming the Truma also includes the giving of the half shekel, then we come to the conclusion that one could not be forced to give that truma of a half shekel, for such a contribution would be invalid. And yet the Mishnah states clearly that by the 25th of Adar, the authorities had the right to enter into the and confiscate property in lieu of the payment of the Machzit HaShekel. So that in effect, the Rebbe's interpretation of this Rashi is in conflict with the Mishnah. One digression of sorts with respect to the Shulchanot and the collection of money and the banking services provided by the Shulchanot that within Christianity there is the account recorded in Matthew 21.12, a document written around the time of the Mishnah that Jesus went into the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers, the Shulchanot, stating that my house shall be called the house of prayer but you have made it into a den of thieves. In studying the Mishnah, one might call into question the accuracy of this story, which, to my understanding, has an important place in the Midrashic-type stories of the New Testament.